Um, just before the screening began, the, um, the US publicist uh, for the film said that all of you involved with the film are amazed that it's in the New York Film Festival. Why is that? Well, because it's uh, a broad comedy. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, although it has, you know, it's got its moments of edginess, I mean, it, it, that's, that's what it is, really. It's a, it's a broad comedy. Um, and uh, I was just quite shocked that they wanted it, <laughs> to be honest. Well, um, we love broad comedies. Why wouldn't we want to have that be a part of the celebration of cinema that well, the New York Film Festival I is? I suppose, in, in, one, in one regard, I mean, uh, um, Partridge in, in Britain is very well known, very popular. Uh, in the US, he's not well known, but he's sort of, he's, he's sort of an underground thing, really. There's uh, certain creative people in the US really like Partridge, but it's very much kind of an underground, so it's got more of a kind of an edgy, culty thing, I guess. There have been rumors that, um, about an Alan Partridge film going back at least 10 years. What took you so long? Um, well, y you know, you go off and do other things, and then you 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 sort of you, you try different things and you work on different projects, and and also when you work quite intensely with the character, we haven't. I mean, the character's been around for like 22 uh, years, uh, 21 years, and um, but we haven't saturated the audience with, with the character. You know, we only did uh, 18 episodes on television. Um, we did some webisodes and the odd special we've done for Sky in the UK. But basically, um, we, 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 uh, we sort of do something with the character, then we walk away and then we come back. And it felt t uh, to us that, you know, it, it, when you've been away from the character for so long, um, you start to miss him. I mean, he's, uh, for me, I've got very, because he's, he's sort of my bet noir, really, Alan. And, um, He's like a sort of a, an annoying relative, really, uh, that you sort of you, you quite like to see on uh, holidays, but uh, you don't want to live with him. Um, and uh, w I, I, I sort of, w when you r you write for the character, it becomes very intense, and because it's like being in a room with Alan Partridge for like several months, which is <laughs> actually really quite annoying after after a while. <laughs> and so you have to uh, walk away. But then after a while, I, I sort of start to miss him and. Uh, we we t we talked about doing a film for a long time, but of course the character is so successful that the pressure is intense, and a lot of people in the UK were expecting it to uh, to uh, not be very good, and um, all, all the uh, reviews and the reaction in the UK has been fantastic. Um, um, you know, all, all the reviews have, have been pretty much universally uh, sort of. Uh, praiseworthy. Um, but certainly the, exp the only thing that in our favor was the expectation was quite low because um, they people were really, a lot of people were saying they shouldn't do this, they shouldn't make this film. And so, so you know, it, it, it's, it's a t it was a tough, tough thing to do. So we had to make sure we, we got it right before we did it. Were there over the years um, different ideas for what the, the movie version, what the movie storyline would be? Did you sort of consider a bunch of ideas and discard them? Yeah, we did. We we talked, you know, we talked. You, you talked through different ideas over the years, you know, before you actually sit down and write the thing. Um, and uh, we had other ideas. One was that Al Qaeda took over the BBC. Uh, um, but uh, and um, Alan was, you know, going to placate them and try to talk to them and reason with them. Um, and you have lots of funny lines that you think of, like you know. I think one one line we had when, when we were thinking of that idea was um, Alan talking to Al Qaeda, and they were saying, uh, "You want to destroy the West." Um, and as far as I'm aware, he said, "The West doesn't want to be destroyed." Surely there's a midway between those two <laughs> points of view. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, no, the thing is, uh, w when when you're dealing with um, Something like that, you know, it undertakes some sort of outrage to happen, and suddenly it's profoundly unfunny. So, we uh, decided to sort of avoid that, and uh, and also we we, we didn't. W the problem with making a film is, you know, of a, a, a TV character is that by his nature he's myopic. So, of course, what you have to do is try and make it in some way cinematic, but 
uh, at the same time not lose that small world quality. So you're trying to square a circle. Um, if you make it too outlandish, then of course it, it, it becomes, you, you know, you lose the, the essence of the character. And if you make it too small and, and parochial, then it won't be, it won't justify itself as a film. So that was always the problem. One of our reference points was Dog Day Afternoon, um, because that film uh, has this ex uh, 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 sort of, there's a big siege in it, and uh, it's an extraordinary event, but it's actually quite localized, and in the scheme of things, not a huge story. Um, but for the people in that area, in Dog Day Afternoon, it, it is a big event. Um, so we, uh, we, you know, we, we that, that, that was a reference point. And I think that the other reference point was Ace in the Hole uh, uh, with um, Kirk Douglas, because uh, what the, the, the essence we took from that w uh, was that Kirk Douglas is, is a photographer and there's a guy trapped down a well in that film, and he's trying to spin the uh, story and try and keep the guy trapped in the well because he wants to uh, you know, capitalize it and make himself a famous journalist. Um, so we sort of use that in the partridge things like to, to the way he tries to capitalize on, on, on the events. Yeah. As you said, you've lived with the character of Alan Partridge for like 22 years and um, perhaps at times he seemed like an albatross around your neck, but um, it would make sense to not immediately do an Alan Partridge film, but try to get your film career going and then return to Alan Partridge when you feel you're, uh, everything's up and running. But um, it seems to me that the Although, uh, by definition, th these kinds of comic characters don't really change or evolve, there has been an evolution in Alan Parker, and certainly with it, uh, Alan Parker, Alan Partridge. <laughs> and um, within this film, I think we see some new colors, let's say, well, in, in you his have character. To, you, you, well, you have to develop the character slightly for, for, for film, because uh, you know, a, a sitcom character is slightly um, caricatured. And because we were doing him on the big screen, we had to make him more nuanced and slightly smaller. Although he is, of course, a comic character and larger than life, he's actually slightly more subtle than he was on television. Um, and that's deliberate. Um, and, and it's slightly more nuanced. And there's a little more empathy. Uh, whereas on the early television stuff, he's just a fool that you laugh at. Um, but when we tr translated into the big screen, we had to make sure that he had this sort of... Uh, he, he, was a, uh, he was a more rounded character. I mean, there are a couple of moments, and they're both kind of close-ups that are held for quite a while on, on you, on Alan Partridge, um, where you get a sense of an inner life. You get a sense of somebody having a realization. Um, I, I think the, the second one is when he decides he's not going to sell out, that he, is, that, he, that, that, that he does have some core... Uh, set of values, and I thought that was a very interesting thing to kind of superimpose on Alan, uh, Alan Partridge or, or introduce to, to the character, but it doesn't, it, it, it didn't sort of throw the character off. It, you no, integrated no, you, you it very well. you have to have well. a redemptive moment, but you don't want him to, but that's why at the end we show that he's still an asshole, you know. Um, you have to sort of come back and remind people that he's still a dis dysfunctional narcissist, but you know, He's got, you know, he's got some redemptive qualities, and uh, you know, he makes the right decision <laughs> at the right time. Um, but really, you, you can't have him changing uh, drastically. I mean, the thing is, uh, what what we did was, whenever there's a problem like that, we, w w you know, at the end of a film, the character's supposed to have learnt something and become enlightened. Um, and uh, what we do is just have Alan say, "I think that's I think I think he says in the, in the uh, radio station. I think he says." Um, I think I've really changed, you know. Um, I mean, you know when someone says that, that they haven't, you know. So uh, that's how we, you know, we, we sort of d dealt with that. Although the ending does suggest that there's been some growth because he's happy to get together with this woman who has two teenage boys, and that was something that, that really, you know, turned him off when he heard that she had kids. Yeah, so you, well, you know, you have to have those beats where you think, oh, he's, he's sort of, uh, he's... You know, he's he's redeemed in some way, um, but at the same time, not throw the baby out with the bathwater. So we have to make sure that the, you know reassure the audience that he's still he's still the same character. So uh, I mean, that's another sort of circle we had to square. Is how do you have him still be this annoying fool essentially, um, but have you know a moment of, of uh, uh, redemption because he's you know and, and part of the, the way you do that is by showing that. 
you know, I, I think Alan works best when the audience thinks uh, they are there but for the grace of God go I. You know, well, when, when he does something which is uh, foolish or stupid, but we're all a heartbeat away from doing the same thing. Most of us don't do the things that Alan Partridge do because we're, we've got better judgment, but um, it's only one small step to sort of doing, doing the wrong thing yeah. or saying the wrong thing. Okay, let's take questions from the press. Yes. Well, that was a definitive yes. Um, are you terrified over the thought that uh, Alan Partridge will become an international phenomenon and you'll have to make sequels? Um, no, because I don't think it will. Um, I, I don't. I, um, I, I, uh, and and also, but I mean, the reason I made this film is because I was doing enough other work that I thought was good uh, that I didn't feel like I was a one-trick pony. I just I, I just wrote a film called Philomena, which I'm sort of uh, which I'm very excited about, which I'm sort of going to be promoting around America. That I, I wrote for me and Judy Dench, and I did a film with Michael Winterbottom. I've done like five films with him now. And because I'd, 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 I'd started to do this other stuff, I was happier to, to, uh, to, to come back to Alan. I didn't feel like I was doing it because I wanted to, not because I had to. Um, but uh, no, I actually, I actually think that it's quite a, a British character. And we didn't, we didn't um, try to Americanize it in any way um, because I didn't want to I didn't want to do that, and, I, and my attitude was always, you know, well, if people like it in the U.S., then that's great. But I, I, I actually, I, I think, really, it's it, it, it will have a cult following. You know, um, I, I, I mean, who, who knows? But um, it's not, you know, it's not one of those. It's not like a Judd Apatow film. It's, it's, it's very, a very British character, and I don't think the Americans particularly warm. Americans like funny films with guys who are ultimately successful, and the British like characters who are basically failures. <laughs> and uh, says a lot about England, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and I don't think that's that. I think that's sort of that 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 inhe that slight in inherent uh, quality of Alan means that he'll never be embraced because I think Americans would just say that guy's a douchebag. Why would I, you know, why would I want to hang out with him? Whereas the British like that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was pointing at you, Jim. I'm waiting for the white mic. Yeah. Nearly there. I'm, I'm sort of curious about why British people like Alan Partridge, but the way I'm going to ask the question is, since we're talking about a fantasy version of him, is what do you think he and the Queen would talk about? Well, I think Alan Partridge is definitely a royalist. Um, he's and he's slightly he's fairly right wing. I think he's got some liberal sensibilities, but he's he would uh, he would just I mean if he had he would be it would be a wet dream for him to meet the Queen and talk to her. <laughs> he would just have he would just enjoy very very. <sighs> inconsequential small talk, you know. I mean, I think he would spend an hour talking about the weather and her corgis. <laughs> what, the Queen? Um, I think the Queen, sort of, unlike other members of the royal family, I even amongst sort of skeptics, uh, ha people have a sort of respect for her. Um, I'm not a royalist. I think... Uh, Bolsheviks had the right idea when it came <laughs> when it comes to royal families, um, <laughs> but um, but uh, <laughs> um, I, I actually I'm I'm not a royalist at all. I I, I think it's, I think it's, you know I think it's uh, it's sort of the the apotheosis of a class system which riddles Britain uh, you know, or, or from throughout British society and we're still sort of slightly class obsessed country and. Uh, and part of that is down to the fact that we still deify this family who um, are there, you know, are the people who are deified through, through just an accident of birth, which is just bonkers. Um, but uh, but the, the Queen uh, uh, 
uh, within that sort of family. I think e even amongst, I mean, you know, I think she she's quite a dignified person. You know. I don't know how we got onto this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Steve, a few years ago, you delivered a um, superb smackdown about the Murdoch Press's outrageous privacy violations. Um, it doesn't seem like a lot's changed since then. Um, well, uh, 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 well the, the, the if you're referring to uh, the um, well, the, we, the the hacking scandal in uh, the UK, yeah. Well, um, there was we had an, there was a public inquiry, uh, the a judicial inquiry, in fact, uh, led by Lord Leveson, that um, who published his findings about a year ago. Um, the, the actual the new body that will uh, the, the uh, uh, the, the uh, which is a self-governing body um, has yet to be set up. Um, so it's not over yet. And um, in actual fact, I think you're wrong. I think things have changed slightly. I think the press are slightly more circumspect uh, at the moment. That may be that they're keeping their powder dry because they want to behave themselves before this body's set up to say, look, we've changed. We're really, really well behaved now. Um, but uh, I, I think uh, I think that there's certainly I think I think that there has been a, a change certainly in terms of the public attitude um, after the uh, uh, Millie Dowler scandal uh, and when they found out lots of uh, victims of crime had been abused by the press I think there, there was a sort of sea change in terms of the public's attitude. Um, and as I say, it's that that's not that's not been resolved yet. So so the uh, the new body that's being set up hasn't um, hasn't been finalised. So that it's it's, that is, it's even though it's <laughs> long and laborious, it's still an ongoing process. So this is quite boring for a lot of people. I was involved in this. I I took legal action against a newspaper who hacked my phone. Um, but um, uh, but uh, yeah, I, uh, that's a long-winded answer. Yes, right in the middle. I was thinking back to Armando, Chris, and the, the radio show back, and, and it seems that one of the pathetic things of Alan is always going back to radio, and you Armand, and Armando and Chris have all moved on to film, television. Do you always think that is, is radio, was him ending up in this failed, sad little radio station always where you imagined Alan would go? Um, no, no it, uh, it was just, um, I mean, we worked in radio originally, um, but we haven't, I, ha I haven't gone back to radio. Um, but uh, it, we just wanted Alan to be doing something which was comfortable but not hugely successful, and local radio seemed the, a good fit, you know. Yes. Um, I have not been familiar with this character before today, um, so I'm wondering... Um, is there a development in his humiliation over 20 years? Uh, is there a development in his humiliation? Yes. I don't think there's a development in his humiliation. I think he, the, uh, it's a character that's, that's been had a profile in the UK for 20 years, but the character has developed. It's become more rounded, less caricatured. Um, um, just because... Otherwise, I, I'd get bored of it, and, and you, and you, like anything, you like to kind of refashion something and 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 reshape it and and improve it, and and uh, so I think the character early on actually was very much um, a kind of um, a farcical character uh, who was very funny, uh, but he was funny because you know you just laughed at him and at his foolishness and. Um, what what what's has developed over the years is um, giving him a little bit of empathy, however f stupid he is, um, and g you know giving him some sort of uh, vulnerability, uh, um, which wasn't there uh, at the outset. Um, so so the, the the character's definitely developed. I mean, it's developed, uh, you know, in in two ways. One, the the character is actually become more rounded, but uh, the way, you know, there are two new writers on the character now, and they've helped develop him and make the comedy more resonant. And the character's changed also because 
people do change. And uh, I mean, early on he was quite right wing. Now he's right wing, but he's developed a liberal sensibility. Um, the same way that you know, some Republican politicians don't mind gay people, um, <laughs> but 30 years ago that wouldn't have been the case. So, you know, so so uh, Alan has to reflect changing social mores. We have time for a couple more um, in the back there. <laughs> what made him pick the room? Pick um, I, I have no idea. We were just improvising, and we and we just said it wouldn't be funny if one of them, one of the characters used to be a drummer in a band and we wanted a band that was slightly obscured and maybe yeah, it seemed like but I like I like the way you redeemed it at the end with how many albums they sold exactly yeah that yeah. was sweet thank you oh. very much <laughs> <laughs> could you be a Marillion fan <laughs> uh, okay last question yes <clears throat> uh, lady in red I'll give it to him. Hi. With so much comedy going on, uh, what was kind of going on behind the scenes, and, and what did you do to keep composed? Uh, well, the, the film was actually a, a bit of a nightmare to make, to be honest. I'd just come off making this other film that I'd put my heart and soul into, and when I started to do this film, it wasn't really ready, so it was, uh, it was very hard. I mean, I was, I was rewriting scenes late, on, late at night, you know, for the next day's shooting, after we finished shooting, I was going to the writing room with the writers, trying to improve the following day's scenes and trying to get a day ahead. Um, and it was it, it was incredibly pressured to make this film. It was an incredibly pressurized uh, experience. It was um, the hardest thing I've done in my life, I think, because. Um, you know, I just couldn't take my foot off the gas at any any moment, um, and it was constantly changing. I mean, uh, uh, sometimes I'd, at one point we'd stop the cameras rolling, and I'd say, "This scene isn't working. Stop filming. We're going to rewrite it right now and make it funny because it's not working." So, I, you know, nothing was ever. We didn't let anything go. You know, yeah, it was a lot of tenacity was involved in in making sure it was uh, you know, as good as it could be. Can you mention a particular scene where you where you had to do that, where you had to stop and, and rework it? Um, well, there were uh, scenes. Uh, there's a scene uh, outside the radio station early on with the drunk woman, which we had to reshoot because I wasn't happy with the way it was working. Um, I saw some of the dailies coming in after about a week uh, of myself as Alan and sidekick Simon in the radio studio, and there were some quite fancy shots um, with moving cameras uh, on um, on tracks, and they were quite dynamic cinematically, but they were really, re it really frightened me because when I saw them in the in the rushes, I thought this is wrong. It's dynamic and interesting, but it distracts you from the comedy. So I had to sort of say, look, we need to make this less inventive cinematically. We, we, you know, we, I want flat, locked off shots of the two of us talking so people can pay attention to the comedy. And too much dynamism with the camera moving on in this particular film uh, was distracting. So, we, you know, for example, we had to, we had to go back and, um, and, uh, and, and t tell the fantastic director of photography to be less inventive. Well, um, we're out of time, but I just want to uh, mention that, that your comment about the Bolsheviks having the right idea about the royal, royal families is going to go around the world. <laughs> Sorry. 